The Falling Wall Science Breakthrough of the Year 2023 in Engineering and Technology. Breaking the Wall of Decarbonization. How CO2 capture and conversion help tackle climate change. Kao Tang Ding, Queen's University. On November 9th, 1989, I was eight years old and lived in a small town, unaware of what was happening around the world. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me. I'm excited to be here to talk about decarbonization. So this year in Canada, where I have been living for 15 years, we have experienced the worst. Um, we have experienced uh, the worst the fire. Um, sorry. Um, yeah. So the the fire season ever. Um, so uh, more than 15 million hectares have gone to smoke, and that number is double the previous record of 7.6 million. And across the countries, uh, more than like, hundreds of thousands of people have been evacuated. And on the other side of the planet, in Vietnam, the country where I come from, flooding had been a frequent disaster. And 5,000, more than like, thousands of houses are destroyed every single year. So climate change has increased both the frequency and the intensity of this severe event, uh, not just in Canada and in Vietnam, but in all around the world. So what can we do about it? Now, the fact is, the people who suffer the most from climate change is often the one from the less developed countries who do not have enough resources uh, to deal with that. And in this case, trying to live with this severe event, like many of my Vietnamese fellow are doing, is the most viable option. Um, but is this what we really want to do? Is this really what we want to see? So how do you slow down the climate change so that we can reduce the risk of the catastrophic consequences, and also to give it more time to deal with the climate change. So if we look at the root of the climate change, then we will see that it is our human activity that actually creates this problem. And every year, we emit billions of tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, and these greenhouse gases trap the heat from the Earth, warming it up. Um, if we continue to increase the CO2 like what we are doing now, then the global temperature can increase up to 4 Celsius degree, and in that case, catastrophic events is unavoidable. So if you want to mitigate the climate change, it is important for us to reduce the CO2 emission as much as possible and as soon as possible. And there are many technologies that are being developed and has been developed to achieve this goal. And one of them is electrochemical conversion that I'm working on. So in this process, we can use electricity to drive a chemical reaction. For example, we can use renewable electricity from wind and solar and convert the CO2 into the carbon neutral fuels. So by doing so, we can store the intermittent electricity in the form of gas and liquid fuels are like the ones that we are using right now. We can also convert the carbon dioxide into the polymer sustainable material so that we can permanently store the carbon dioxide, making a carbon negative process. Or we can also combine CO2 conversion with nitrogen to make fertilizer and for the agriculture application. And that's so amazing and simple. It doesn't it? It looks simple as well, but in fact, it's not. Now, imagine a CO2 molecule enter a reactor. So it's going to go through multiple phases. At first, the gas phase, and then it trapped into the solution, and then the CO2 
stabilize on the surface of the solid, that is the calyx. And this is where the CO2 molecule is broken into the smaller molecule or atom. And these atoms, small molecules, are further combined with the other molecules to make different type of products. So how do we control this process? Because every single step here will determine what kind of product you, you produce, how fast you can produce it, how much energy you need to produce it, or how long can you make it, or how stable your system is. And if we want to convert CO2 efficiently, then we need to get everything right. So a few years ago, when I started working on this technology, we focused on improving the stability of the system, meaning that we can maintain high selectivity for a long period of time. And at that time, the best system for CO2 conversion to ethylene lasts for only a few hours. Um, and we discovered that the reason for the failure of the system is because of the degradation of the electrode over time, where the CO2 molecule is converted. So we reinvented the structure of the electrode. We used a very stable polymer combined with the active layer, the red layer there, and then we covered them with a protecting layer. And using this system, we were able to maintain high ethylene selectivity for about 150 hours. And we stopped the reaction. It's only because we need to resubmit our paper. We also demonstrated that we can scale up this technology. So in the context of carbon x competition, we scale up our reactor about a thousand times. So we start with the left scale um, reactor size with the size of a Rubik's cube. We can convert about a gram of CO2 per day. And then we end up making a reactor with the size of about a microwave that can convert 2.5 kilograms per day. And at that time, this is one of the largest electrochemical CO2 conversion demonstrated. And so far, we have been using the pure CO2 as a feedstock, and it worked very well. Now, in order to get pure CO2, we need to extract it from the atmosphere or from flue gas or from industrial processes, and then purify it. And that costs a lot of energy. So, if we look at how the nature has been converting for millions of years, and we see that it does not, re it does not rely on pure CO2. Now take an apple tree, for example. It takes the carbon, diluted carbon, directly from the air, converts the carbon dioxide into carbohydrate, and then it ends up making pure and beautiful apples. And without any purification, without and the separation of the product, and it's ready for consumption. Now, the question is, can we do CO2 conversion like the way that the apple tree does? Starting from diluted CO2, making concentrated product in a single system. So my team at Queen's University, we have been working on such a system for about a year. So we use both concentrated CO2 and also diluted CO2, we capture them in a solution, and then we feed the solution inside the reactor. And then the gas product coming out from the reactor is spontaneously separated from the liquids so that we can have concentrated uh, product to reduce the energy cost for the separation. And the key thing in our system is the electrode that we use so if we zoom in on the surface of the electrode about 100,000 times, then we will see this small complex structure, like the figure on the right there. Um, and you might wonder how and where we're going to get this material. Well, we try different kind of materials, and the best one comes from this, Amazon. So we did not use complex material. We do not use expensive material. We use the material that people use in their garden to prevent insects. And my student didn't bother even like, clean the substrate before use. Yeah. They just cut it, place it in the reactor, and then work their magic. 
So they activate the material inside the reactor, and it worked perfectly. Now, with about $100, a Canadian dollar, now you can buy enough material to build a system that can convert about 10 tons of CO2 per year. And with this small piece of copper here, that costs less than a dollar, you can build a reactor that can consume amount of CO2 as much as 5 to 10 mercury tree. So if we are going to meet the scale, billion ton scale CO2, we, not, we need not just the efficient uh, system, but the system that built from inexpensive and earth abundant material. So where we are now in CO2 conversion, it really depends on what kind of product that you want to produce. Um, for example, now for simple products, then we are quite advanced and uh, we are ready for, we are closer to the demonstration at large scale. Uh, but for the quite complex product, um, we are still in the early stage. Take ethylene, for example, a rather challenging product here. So we know how to convert the CO2 to ethylene selectively. We are quite close to our target of 90-95%. We also know how to run the reaction with a very high rate. We already achieved our target uh, of the reaction rate there. But there is still a challenge in energy efficiency and the system stability. Now, for energy efficiency, it still costs a lot of electricity just to make one kilogram of ethylene. And for the stability of the system, we are still a long way uh, to get 1,000 and 10,000 of our stability. But the good news is we know why our system had low energy efficiency. We also understand the key factor that make our system unstable. And the fact is, the electrochemical CO2 conversion field has moved rapidly in the last decade. Now, 10 years ago, again, the best system for CO2 conversion to ethylene lasts for only a few hours. And now, we are talking about hundreds of hours as the benchmark for the stability. Now, 10 years ago, no one reported energy efficiency. But now we quantify it. We emphasize this so that just to make sure that we are on the right path uh, to achieve our goal. So I have no doubt that we are going to get there. I just hope that we're going to get there soon enough. OK, now imagine now if we can build a natural chemical CO2 conversion system that work like an apple tree, but with much higher efficiency and of course, making a variety of different products, not just Apple. Then we can implement this technology in virtually anywhere in the world. Because we just need air, we need water, and we need renewable energy, like from wind and solar. Now, if we can do that, then not only we can reduce the CO2 reduction and slow down the climate change, but the important thing is, we give the opportunities for everyone, and especially the ones that are from less developed countries now have the chance to have access to clean energy, clean fuel, sustainable material, and sustainable fertilizer. And that is, to me, a truly sustainable world. Thank you very much. <laughs>